Welcome to Celebrating Act Two. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back. We're here once again with one of our favorite uh, people, John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. And uh, how are you doing, John Coleman, my partner? Good, good. Good to see you again, John. Nice to be back on. Hey, uh, in uh, one of our most recent uh, conversations with you, you mentioned uh, sommeliers, uh, the professional, uh, they're accredited uh, they taste. They break the open the bottle. They taste the wine. They swirl it around, um, and and you've also talked about our palate, uh, developing uh, 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 not just a, a taste for wine, knowing what you like, but developing a palate, a sensitive palate, so you can tell um, this from that. You can you can figure out what's good about this wine or what's right. For instance, I, I love the reviews that that. Um, they tell me this wine is fruity and blah, blah, has a hint of almonds. They, I don't know who can figure that out, but when I taste wine, <laughs> I get, I like it, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I do know, I've developed my taste to the point where I know that I like dry wine instead of particularly sweet wine, um, but not exclusively. So here's my question for you. I want to develop my wine palate. Where do I begin? When I take that first glass, that sip, what am I looking for to see? I think by posing the question, you are already suggesting that, hmm, you know, I do like wine. Um, I don't know anything about it, really. But what I've had, I really like, and I think I'd like to know a bit more. Um, because if you don't really like wine, and I know an awful lot of people, they go to dinner parties or even to the restaurant, and they pour the wine in there, and they don't even drink it. They don't even, I mean, they barely touch it. You know, they just, they just want to seem like they like wine or enjoy wine. <clears throat> and they order it almost as a, a matter of uh, principle. As a, so if you do like wine, there's every reason in the world to find out more about it so you will like it even more, enjoy it even more. <laughs> And become as expert as you wish to be, and uh, you know it's a it's a lifelong study. Um, I don't know everything about wine that I will five ten years from now, or I mean, you know, far too much about wine than is good for any one person. Uh, sommeliers and some wine writers are of a very strange sort. They have fallen in love with, become enthralled by. Um, uh, become addicted to, not to alcohol, but to the whole idea of wine and what's in it. And the sommelier has to study, uh, if you want you know, to get an advanced certificate like master sommelier um, or some master of wine, these people go through years and years of study. And that's like preparing for Jeopardy because they will be asked, what are the three greatest vineyards in the Baden-Baden section of Germany? And you'll be asked to taste the wine completely blind um, and can you identify this? What's interesting about those uh, very abstruse musings is that the um, testors, the examiners, don't really expect for you to say, oh, let me tell you something. Oh, I know exactly what this is. This is an Australian cardamonet, which is only made once every three years in the South. I mean, nobody expects that. What, you, what these guys would say is, well, I'm getting flavors here very fruit forward, so it's from a warm climate, and therefore I'm going to tend to say it could be Australian, and uh, they had a draft. So, and the, the examiners are looking for, oh, I like the way this guy's mind works. He knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> for the average person uh, to get anywhere near that extent of knowledge is uh, the difference between somebody uh, studying to be a... a, a, a a brain surgeon as opposed to becoming a, uh, a nurse, okay? Both notable, as we all know, in their own way, but one takes a whole lot more knowledge to achieve. Um, so at the basic level, if you really say, I really like what I want to know more about it, the first thing to do is to set off your own tasting of two different kinds of wine. By kinds of wine, I mean varietals. By varietals, I mean grapes, okay? <clears throat> so if you buy... Go out and buy a California Cabernet. 
Sauvignon, okay? Which is the same grape that is used in Bordeaux. So you can buy a Bordeaux, but I, I like the, to do these things. If you're going to be tasting the difference, you should take some big examples. In California, Cabernets tend to be big and massive. And then buy a California Pinot Noir, okay? Which is a different grape. It's called a finicky grape because it's difficult to make in a, in a poor year, uh, as well as uh, Bordeaux. Bordeaux have, uh, I'm sorry, rather, Cabernet Sauvignons have much more tannin, firmer, more solid, and so forth. So here you have two very distinct um, taste profiles. And I'm not saying that immediately upon drinking them, you'll say, you'll say, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe these are so different. You might taste them and say, yeah, well, this, this Cabernet it does taste. It does taste kind of different. It's it's it's, it's big. It's more it's, it's richer. It's uh, as a on the back of my throat. I'm getting getting what we call tan. It's kind of astringent. And now, well, this comes, this this Pinot Noir. Um, oh, it's more. It's I don't know, lack of a better word, kind of flowery and or, or aromatic. And it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't really taste like the Cabernet Sauvignon. <clears throat> That's how to begin. And the same goes for white wines. To take two white wines that are very different, like a Chardonnay, again from California, because as I say, they, they, these reveal more bigger flavors. And take a Chardonnay from California, and then take something like a Pinot Grigio from Italy, and taste both those, and you'll say, "Oh yeah, these are these are really different wines. This is much lighter." This I would drink with certain things, and this this, this Chardonnay, boy, that tastes like something I'd really want to drink with uh, grilled fish and so forth. So that's how you begin. Um, and once you go that route, and once you um, think that you like it that way, then you're going to become not more adventurous at first, but just, oh, I'm going to start tasting more Pinot Grigios. I'm going to order two or three and drink them throughout the, the week, so I'm getting to know what Pinot Grigio tastes like. I'm getting to know what a Chardonnay tastes like. Oh, this is pretty buttery. This is this is this is tastes like a little more woody. Uh, these are the descriptors that professionals will use, but they go into into ditty rams about finding a cedar box and and, and rat's tail and uh, cut uh, cut garden hose and uh, I don't know if they, those things are supposed to be good in a while, but these this, this is the type of stuff that they uh, go into. So. Start very basic with two different varietals of red, two different varietals of white. And if you like what you've just done, if you enjoyed the little experiment you've done all by yourself, and go on from there. You know, uh, John, um, uh, the uh, descriptions that you're giving of um, somebody who's really experienced and can taste things, uh, and I know that for many years at least, uh, whether it's myth or real, uh, the French wines were supposed to be the only really great wines, and then maybe there was an oh, Italian oh. or a German here and there. And then there was a ser series of uh, taste-offs or taste tests between California, blind tastes between California and others, where California, when when perhaps the taster really didn't know and uh, could only determine that this is really a good whatever it is. And... Wow, it happens to be from California. Were those really staged, or were those real? Um... They, they were real, and they were enormously important for the California wine industry. It, it took place back in the 70s, <clears throat> and they matched up uh, California red wines against uh, some of the very best um, uh, French wines from the same vintage. But there's the key. There's the little deception. There's the little, uh, what do they call it, that diversion to throw somebody off. If you taste a, uh, let's say, a 2015 French Bordeaux from a great um, vineyard, that wine takes a while to come around. They also tend, by virtue of the soil they are raised in and the way those French Bordeaux are made from the Cabernet Sauvignon grape, and other grapes are always put in there also, okay? So you're getting a blend of wines that are blended a certain way that do not have much tannin and take some time to come around. You take a California Cabernet Sauvignon, and in those days they were almost 100% Cabernet Sauvignon without the others in the blend. So that's like a fist in the face. They're big, they're tannin, they tend to have high alcohol, and if presented side by side and you taste them, 
These days, people would say, oh, this is a Bordeaux and this one's from California. But back then in the 1970s, you're presented with uh, this remarkably powerful fruit-driven wine, and you don't know what it is, you don't know where it's from, you say, this is impressive. And that's basically what happened back then. So the, 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 the um, lesson was that, yeah, California red wines can be terrific, but they shouldn't necessarily be compared in the same vintage with a uh, French wine, which is a blend of other grapes. But the point was well taken, and, um, and it was true that California makes great wine, just as Italy does and New Zealand does. And, and that, was a big, that was a big green light, however. Uh, at the time. John, is there, um, as, as I develop my palate for wines and I'm able to better discern the differences of mm. wines, is there any, uh, any great benefit of comparing, let's say, Australian reds mm. to California and French reds? Uh, are, am I going to find any difference really between well, of course, all wines could could be different, but a am I going to find any difference because it's from Australia or because it's from Argentina? Uh, you know, those are not known as the premier wine markets of the world, I don't think. Well, they, they are big, big markets, but uh, per premier, that, that, that's another thing. Um, what determines what wine tastes like, there's many, many factors, obviously. But if you're all, let's say you give all the same exact grapevine to the Australian and the Argentinian and the Californian and the French guy, they are putting, just like your backyard, you know, you live in California, the soil in your backyard is different than is for me here in the Northeast. And my wife has a great green thumb and she would know exactly what to plant. She says, well, well, well you know, you don't plant that kind of grapevine here. It would just, it's too hot. It's too cold. It's not that the altitude is too high. There's not enough irrigate, uh, not enough water. You have to going to have to irrigate these things. All of those are very big factors in determining even what will grow in that territory. So now you've got Australian soil and you've got uh, Italian soil and you've got French soil. And there's, there, there's very good wines being made in Lebanon. Even in New Mexico, there are some sparkling wines. So, yeah, they call it terroir, which means the territory. It's the composition of the soil. And I'll tell you a little um, story once. I was in uh, the Loire Valley in France <clears throat> and um, going through the vineyards with the winemaker and producer there. And there was a plot of land, probably the size of, uh, oh, I'd say it's about maybe 10 yards by 20 yards. That was just completely fallow, kind of really red dirt, just sitting there, untilled, not used. And next to it, on this side and that side, were beautiful grapevines bursting with grapes. And I said, well, what is it? You're just letting this lie fallow for a while and you'll plant again next year? He says, oh, no, 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 no. He says... This comp the, the, the composition of that soil is too rich and has too much iron in it. it says this is the, if I wanted to plant California Cabernet, that's this is where I'd plant it. Now this is in his own vineyard, and the differences are distinct. I was in Burgundy once, the highway that goes through the best part of Burgundy, which is called the Côte de Nuit, the Côte d'Or, and it's flat as a road should be, <clears throat> and to the right side, the vineyards are all on flat land. As you walk up from the road, up the vineyard to the left side, there's a gradual slope. It's not even, there's barely a hillside, just a gradual slope. And the winemaker says, okay, taste these, taste these grapes down here by the, uh, uh, down here by the roadside. I taste, he said, oh, these are good. He said, yeah, this is a great vineyard. We always get great grapes out of here. And he says, now let's proceed up the hill. We went 10 yards. Taste the grape here. Oh, that's that has sweeter meaning, more sugar, and that's going to ferment into better better wine alcohol. Well, let's go another ten yards. The ones up that elevation, which was I'm not talking about a mountain here, gets the most sun at the best time of the day than the flatlands do, which is why slopes are always the grapes. The best grapes are always grown on slopes, not down on the valley floor. Okay? And I said, wow, <clears throat> so these are grapes are terrific. He says, see what I mean? And he says, now come over here. And there was a plot over here, just another 10 yards away. And he says, taste these grapes. And I tasted them and said, boy, these aren't very good. 
He says, that's right. I said, well, why? We're on the same exact slope, same exact. And he says, we don't know why. For hundreds, thousands of years, the composition of this right next to this is different. And this will never raise good grapes. So when you say, are there distinctions uh, between Australia, New Zealand, and Argentina? Oh, yeah, big distinctions. So don't expect a Sonoma Valley um, uh, 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 Pinot Noir and Gata California <clears throat> to taste the same way it would in Burgundy. And then you get into, get into another whole discussion sometime about the manipulation of vines. And once the wine gets back to the vineyards, uh, to, to the uh, winery, what can you do there to make it taste like your wine and not the other guy's wine? Wow. Great lesson. Great beginning. Great place to start my educating my palate so I yes. can better discern the differences. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, thank you much. Uh, and by the way, I just want to assure the audience that while it skipped me in my generations, uh, my three kids who uh, are three and eight years apart uh, are all uh, very much uh, uh, what I call them aficionados. I don't know, but they love wine. They talk to each other about wine. They uh, suggest and every so often pick up a bottle and, and share it on a particular meal. So they have developed a palate. And so, uh, John, I expect you and my three kids to be able to share wines, uh, John Coleman, and yes. uh, develop your palates. And then well, we can all then turn around and bow to John Mariani, who can tell you. Bow it. It's just money. But, but the bottom line is that uh, the first thing you have to do is enjoy whatever wine it is that you're uh, having and uh, go from there. no morality in not loving wine, you know? I mean, some people just don't care for it. Well, well this has been great. That, that would be art. Hmm? That would be art. Yes. He's just not a wine drinker. Well, he doesn't. You don't drink alcohol at all. Uh, very, not very much. I actually grew up uh, in, in business in the garment district, and that was all mm. hard liquor. And I could hold uh -huh. my own there, but I never really developed a taste for uh, yeah. anything. And nobody ever ordered wine uh, no. down there. It was <laughs> it was always really really hard stuff. So. Um, uh, in any event, uh, but I do appreciate people, and I do every so often enjoy a good glass of wine. And I'm looking forward to John uh, Coleman, you uh, uh, getting together with me and sharing bottles of wine that you've enjoyed. Yes. Yeah. Well, if I enjoyed them too much, you won't have anything to share. So, John, thank you again. Appreciate it. And I want to remind everybody to uh, to look up your uh, virtual gourmet newsletter at johnmariani.com where there are tons of articles about wine and restaurants and travel, even though we're not talking about travel these days because of the COVID-19, I still love your travel articles. So uh, they're a lot of fun to read. A lot of fun to write. I'll write them again. Good. Okay. Uh, Art, so great. it's time to say goodbye. This time until next time. Thank you, John Mariani, for uh, just sharing these wonderful uh, stories uh, and your knowledge with us. We appreciate it and look forward to our uh, uh, next get together in the near future. So until that time, to everybody in the audience, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John Mariani. Thank you, John Coleman. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. Thank you.